in the tape, uh, my guest is Pauline Kale, and the book is Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang. The four words, two words repeated that tell us what films are about. Love and violence, or oh, love, at least outwardly. Atlantic Little Brown of the publishers, and it's, it's uh, if you want to know about films, but more than that, how they're made, the people who make them, but about yourself and what it means to us today, I think this is a remarkable work. And we'll come back to the young, the impact. Something you said, we'll come back to Stagecoach, I wonder, this should be free and easy, right. about the young. As you said, this seems so, I'm sure everyone is aware of this, the young, and many ignore the stage. To the young, the film is the medium, is it? Is it? Well, I, I don't know how to explain this because uh, I, I dragged my daughter to see a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. I was sorry. I didn't care for the play myself. I think it's highly overrated. But her response to it was there's nothing visual going on, meaning it was deathly to her sitting there watching people on, on the stage. And I think what we forget now when we try to persuade people to get interested in theater is that what made us love theater was the presence of great artists on the stage. I think if my daughter had seen a great performer, she would not have complained about nothing visual going on. But when you see routine actors who are not as good as the ones on the screen, then you notice how static stage, uh, stagecraft is. But you know, very few kids now get a chance to see great performers. I grew up on, you know, I saw Nazimo and ghosts. I saw all the great performances of my time, whereas now you go to a play and, and the performers are mediocre, and so then our kids say, ah, but movies have so much going on. With the exception, of course, of you, you have a piece, of course, on him, uh, Olivier, of course, Olivier's Othello, and you think of, isn't it interesting, you thought of a comedian, Olivier's a comic, and uh, John Barrymore, of course, two farseers, would, but go ahead. I think... Uh, uh, these men, whether on screen or on stage or wherever, have enough power of personality and presence, uh, have enough artistry to, to communicate themselves in, in any medium, because essentially the Olivier Othello was a record of a stage performance because they couldn't raise enough money to make it properly as a movie. Here we come again, don't we, to Wells and Olivier, and not speaking of the two now as actors, but two rather unique people, or unique artists. Wells has a, an actor director, producer, per and, and uh, Olivier, prim although he's a director, primarily a magnificent performer, actor, yet each one has difficulty. Great difficulty, and no one has ever accused Olivier of being temperamental or extravagant, and yet he cannot raise money to make the movies he, he, should, have, he should have performed in and directed, because he is himself a competent enough movie director, but he couldn't raise money to make Macbeth, which he desperately wanted to make as a film, uh, whereas personalities, I mean, men who make it as personalities more than as performers, as I think Richard Burton has, can raise money uh, for projects they want to do. Uh, but Olivier, despite his greatness, has never been a big enough box office draw. So that I know men who have wanted to make movies with, with Olivier who have had to cancel their projects because the studio said the banks wouldn't give them money on Olivier. Even when Olivier was willing to work for nothing to do a part he wanted to do, they couldn't finance a picture. Because you have a very fascinating uh, piece here on Lawrence Olivier's Othello, and uh, as the audience probably knows, has created a great deal of pro and con discussion, particularly among Negro performers who resented it very much. And you point out that it's a rather fascinating portrayal. Oh, I think it's great. I was, uh, I was rather upset. I did hear that Poitier and some others had walked out on, on the movie taking offense, and yet I think Olivier did what Poitier still cannot dare to do, which is he gave the sexual magnetism uh, of Othello. He, he gave uh, certain ambiguities in the character, which Negro actors don't quite dare to. Also, I, I think Poitier could have been a really great actor. I think Poitier in movies like mm -hmm. uh, A Man is Ten Feet Tall really was marvelous. I think he had great abilities. I think now he's become almost a black Cary Grant. I think he's the most beautiful, graceful, elegant actor on the screen. And when people say, why is he a big box office star, I don't think it's because he's black. I think it's because he's straight and he's gorgeous. I and he's almost the only actor like that we've got. I'm not quite sure I agree with you as to his uh, profundity as an actor. I myself, I think he I think I myself he am not too sure of that. Uh, oh, oh but, I think uh, he was but, marvelous uh, in his early roles. I think he had a kind of dynamism stud. I think he was great. But, but now he's, he's become a real movie star. And that's not the worst thing. And he's done it because he wanted to protect 
his image as a Negro actor because he's been afraid to play roles that, neg that, that possibly might lead to hostilities toward Negroes. But I think it is, it's a mistake for him not to understand the greatness of what Olivier did but as a Coming Othello. back, there's a marvelous sentence you use here. I'd like to <laughs> play around with it. And also I'd like to talk about Frank Finley's uh, Iago, which I found perhaps even more fascinating. You say, talking about Olivier's Othello, Pauline Kael, and she, says, she saw ropes into it, but Olivier seemed to dig in deeper. And the phrase here, possibly Negro actors need to sharpen themselves on white roles so they can play a Negro, which is fascinating. But I also think the reverse may be true, too. Oh, possibly sure. white actors need to sharpen themselves on Negro roles so they can play a white man. And it's a very good point. Well, you know, Olivier is one of the few who's ever brought it off. And he really worked at it. When you consider that Olivier is a small man, close to 60, with a bad heart and other things, and yet as Othello, he was huge, he was powerful, he was young. You know, just as you say this, again, I suppose this is the difference of stature of actors. Olivier, as against, and this is very unfair, of course, as against say, James Stewart and Gary Cooper, but reading Pauline Kael's work, uh, you notice uh, themes interlock and overlap, and you think of something you said earlier, you said something about Olivier Although his medium height has a hugeness about him of stature, whether stage or screen, because of his imagination artistry, whereas tall men of infinitely lesser talent, this is just a truism, of uh, whether Gary Cooper, try to be ordinary, small, and well-liked, you know. It, it's, uh, it's too bad uh, that, that what happens then in, of course, the mass media is these men who simulate the ordinary man, which is, of course, not what they are, because these are immensely powerful, rich, successful actors, are just the ones who always get the great publicity. Uh, you know, you think of the fact that the actors who never make any trouble are the ones who are so loved in the mass media. You know, everyone said when Clark Gable went, the king has died. Well, what was Clark Gable the king of? Did any man ever play more roles that didn't matter than Clark Gable? Interesting, this, this uh, also the analogy you draw in reverse way between Clark Gable and Marlon Brando, that Gable was the good sport, did That's all these right. roles, but Brando could not. He'd had to almost mock the role he did. But that's, that's the great thing about Brando. Brando couldn't play a James Stewart role. It would be grotesque. When he tried to play the ordinary, you know, good sheriff in the chase, it was absurd. Uh, when Brando has a role that's too small for a man of real instinct and sensitivity, he can only mock it. He can make it seem ridiculous. And I think the audience responds to the mockery. They enjoy Brando, even in these mediocre roles, because they can see he's too big for them. All we're doing here is really touching on the uh, different aspects of Pauline Kael's book. Her analysis of Bergman is interesting. We haven't even talked about the 280 films of the variety of years. Of what, how many years are these films? Oh, well, they cover almost from the beginning. I tried to give a range of, of movie-going experiences to, to suggest the kind of experiences you can have at the movies. Because I think most of us, you know, we're not born yesterday, and we've seen one heck of a lot of movies before we're in a position to evaluate new ones. This is one of the difficulties with younger students who haven't seen very many movies. They don't understand why you're not excited about the latest well, Western. This, isn't this the horror of uh, Elaine? eliminating the original John Ford stagecoach, as you say, so a past is eliminated, so the kids see a second-rate facsimile. Of well, fortunately, the colleges run a great many old movies now, and most old movies do circulate. Uh, very few of them have been withdrawn, finally. Sometimes they're withdrawn from a period of years, but then they get reinstated, because, of course, there's still money in them, even in 16 millimeter. I want to come back to these 280 films. Uh, as you, you, the reader, or I, I project myself at the moment, you uh, am I, I am you, uh, the various films, were they, they're American films, the European films, I see uh, the golden age of comedy, the gold rush, just looking just casually through the magnificent Ambersons, there's Wells again, and as you say, his use of sound, the American sound. But some, sometimes something hits you as you read the Pauline Carey, he says, that's what I wanted. That's what I was thinking of. And when you review Miracle of Milan, I couldn't think of this marvelous old woman in the opening sequence where she, she picks up this orphan, finds him, and he spills the milk, and she makes something. Instead of bawling him out, she, her imagination, she makes a little 
railroad track of milk or something. She makes a game of it, like like modern progressive parents. Yeah, but I never forgot uh, her. Yeah, Emma Grammatica. And she, she was, was an very Eleanor, old. Eleanor Dusa. Yeah, she had stuff. followed Dusa yeah. in in some of the great Italian roles, and she was mar. Well, you know, one of the great things about movies is what they do preserve. I've seen Dusa on film, and I know now that Stark Young was right when he described her. Formerly, I had only known Eleanor Dusa's style from Stark Young's descriptions, and then I saw this early Italian film, and she really is the predecessor of Garbo and of the whole naturalistic school of acting, uh, which of course became the great uh, movie acting, because she was the opposite of Bernhardt. What Bernhardt had was the great voice. It's unjust to see Bernhardt on film because she's terrible. She's so stylized and old-fashioned. When you hear Bernhardt's records, however, she's great because the voice has the magic, but unfortunately she made silent films. Interesting. Pauline Kael mentioned Stark Young, and in a sense, Pauline Kael carries on the tradition of Young. And the critics are so needed. Now, we, when we say, we mean reviewers now, the critic who helps us dig back into a past continuity of what is, what can be. Since you mentioned Eleanor Dusa and Bernhard Dusa, the films, and Bernhard obviously can't. Uh, remember Bernhard Shaw's comment? He saw them both, both elderly, in the same role. Dusa, no makeup. Bernhardt, all kinds of makeup, and uh, Shaw said, I prefer the Italian. Her wrinkles are her credentials of humanity. Uh, oh, they're really great on film. Her she's, are she's, uh, Her humanity is extraordinary. You watch this old woman, her hair is white, and yet she's incredibly beautiful. And she has something of what the young Garbo had. And it is amazing. It's a simplicity of movement that she instinctively understood. And apparently she had it on the stage in a period when everyone else was using a, a high degree of artifice. As we wander back and forth using Pauline Kael's book, Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, as our, our guide, we talked about a moment of the Sacris and Miracle of Milan, uh, references, analyses of De Sica. The tragedy here, too, De Sica and Wells, both. I mean, De Sica has to be an actor, highly paid, to raise his own, I remember interviewing him in Rome, he has to raise his own, do the films he wants to do, That's right. as well as has to act in a lot of junk, I'm sure. I think a great many people don't realize how many men in show business, and women too, pay for their, the rare artistic opportunities by years uh, of, of dirty work. That is to say, routine commercial pictures, or even alternating it. I mean, a man like Carol Reed paid for An Outcast of the Islands, which is a marvelous film that lost money by doing a couple of routine thrillers. I mean, the artists always have to pay in these ways. You have to earn your chances for integrity. And that's what people in, in mass media don't understand. It takes a lot of digging before you realize how hard it is to do what you want to do, to, to get your opportunity. And many people never get it. Many men of talent never do what they might have done. You know, I just put down words here, talking about the various films. I want to return to the group and something else. A novel of an intelligent woman, and this is connected with Ship of Fools too, a novel of an intelligent woman. I want a couple of men of craft, but less talent due to it. But I have notes here. Man of Aran, Flaherty's great documentary, La Strada, certain moments. The Stars Look Down, which I remember very well, the chrono film about the Welsh miners. And here again, uh, working men were shown, not glorified, but as human with their frailties. Well, movies have very rarely used uh, a woman's sensibility uh, because of th this is a it's a very difficult thing to explain to people that in show business women have traditionally followed a prostitute role and for people to work their way out of it is very difficult and so women are almost never uh, directors in Hollywood. They get in through sort of little back doors into writing sometimes or into editing uh, but it's very very difficult in a medium in which women traditionally have filled the prostitute role for women to be taken seriously and so even when a novel of feminine sensibility like Ship of Fools or the group is made Made, it is then turned over to a male screenwriter who in these cases, in both of them, Abby Mann and Sidney Buckman, are both so condescending to women that they completely distort the role of the women in the movies. And even unconsciously, they're not even aware of it. Uh, but in neither case was it considered to have the woman who wrote the book do her own screenplay. Yeah. I think this is fascinating. Perhaps dwell on this a bit, Pauline. You're very close to both these works. Uh, one throughout the casting, the set, 
the directing of the group and, of course, your analysis of Stanley Kramer's work sets in here, too. Here are two highly sensitive women. Uh, let's take Mary McCarthy's group for a moment. Uh, she had an idea in describing girls at a certain time, and two liberal-minded men saw it almost one-dimensionally as That's intelligent right. girls, unequipped for life, girls are vaster. They, uh, she saw it in a much more ambivalent way. That's right. I, yeah, I don't think it's a good book. Uh, I mean, the peculiar thing is that neither of these novels is really quite a successful novel, but both of them have marvelously interesting material and are seen from a woman's point of view, and the woman in both cases is very tough on other women, whereas the men who, 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 di who then distorted the points of view completely lost sight of what they were trying to get at. In Ship of Fools particularly, Catherine Ann Porter identifies uh, with the central young girl in it, who's the woman artist. But Abby Mann, in rewriting it, has made that girl the enemy of art. Uh, and I think unconsciously, in his case, I think truly unconsciously. Uh, and Buckman and Lumet really didn't understand the complexities of Mary McCarthy's point of view. They were very hostile to her because she was a Trotskyite intellectual in a period when they were both liberal Stalinist intellectuals, and they never really saw the whole range of, of ideas that she was bringing to bear on this period. Yeah, two different, it's interesting, but even over and above that, uh, the fact that they're men and she's a woman, probably was, a, was again, we have to, I guess we have to dwell on this, and Pauline Kael, by the way, is a, she's a movie critic. She happens to be a woman's a matter of describing her, but that is all. But this is, this is an aspect, isn't it? You can't avoid Well, this, can't you know, it's very funny. Uh, lately, people have been saying, why are there so many women uh, movie critics? Well, you know, there aren't. There are only a few. Uh, I'm a member of the National Society of Film Critics, and there are, I believe, 13 men. And up until last week, when Penelope Gilliatt joined us, I was the only woman. Uh, but it is interesting that around, even around the fringes of show business, there's a fear as soon as you get one or two women in a field, as if they're taking over. There's not a single woman director in Hollywood now functioning. At one point, Dorothy Arzner uh, actually directed Joan Crawford and a few other movies. There hasn't been a woman director in Hollywood for many years, except Ida Lupino made a few uh, small budget productions. Uh, there is no sense of the fact that a whole range of experience may be left out. Now people are talking about uh, why aren't there more Negroes in movies, uh, but women with the benefits of education and all sorts of things for a much longer period are still outside the industry. Before I know you have to leave for another program, Pauline Kael, there are two things we have to talk about, and one involves Lillian Hellman's own analysis. The film was, I, I didn't see, but is pretty terrible. I guess she agrees. The chase. There's a, there's a, there's a dialogue here. I'll be the critic asking you. Be Lillian Hellman. This concerns something. Uh, talking now about a certain time when individual men made the film, beginning That's with right. Chaplin or Griffith. Well, I had panned uh, the chase, which Lillian Hellman got the screenplay credit for, <laughs> but then I read her own explanation for it in an interview in the New York Times, and so I asked for permission to add that to my review because I felt that perhaps I had been too unkind to her because she disclaimed responsibility also. Let's do this dialogue if sure. we can. I'll be the interviewer. And I, says, I hear you did a year's work on the chase, but that you didn't see it until a few weeks ago. And Miss Hellman replies, I wasn't allowed to see it until a few weeks ago. Uh, what did you think of it? That an old and foolish dream is ended, and there will be no such for me again. What dream? To write a picture the way you write anything else. Decision by democratic majority vote is a fine form of government, but it's a stinking way to create. So two other writers were called in, and that made four with Mr. Spiegel and Mr. Penn, and what was intended as a modest picture about some aimless people on an aimless Saturday night got hot and large, and all the younger ladies in it have three breasts, and, well, it's far more painful to have your work mauled about and slicked up than to see it go in a wastebasket. feel that you lost a year's work. I wouldn't care much about losing. That's the chance you take when you write anything. Ach, it's too old a Hollywood story for anybody to want to hear it again. Anyway, I've got a new theory, or maybe an old one dressed up. Want to hear? Sure. Movies always belong to one man, the director, and early movie makers like Griffith and Chaplin knew it. 
Then along came talking pictures. Words are something else again, and they frightened the boys who didn't know many, so they brought out good writers like Faulkner and Fitzgerald. But such people can't and don't take or even understand fiddling and mangling, and so they were lost or went away. Right then and there, it should have been obvious that a new method had to be found. The Europeans began to find it right after the war. The director wrote the picture, or he had a man or six men who worked so closely with him that it looked as if one person had made the picture. And then you admire the European movies. Sometimes, certainly not always. Even the best of them, like Fellini's, often go wandering around, too loose and lush and aimless for my taste. They need more script, as our pictures need less. Why not a new kind of script? A kind of outline of action, the sequences in order, the characters loosely defined, the end in view. Beyond that, and that of course is a great deal, you would write only the first few lines of each scene, leaving the rest to be improvised, going loose with what is there, or throwing it out if something better came along. The director would have something solid to rest on, but nothing so rigid that he would feel as cramped as he often does now. That's the kind of script I'd like to try some day. But never, never again, these old, weary disappointments. In a way, Lillian Hellman is telling us uh, in this brief interview what you're saying in a wholly different, uh, one dimensional way, what it's all about. What it's about is that the best people have their lives wasted, and that's the hell of motion pictures. Yeah. Of course, we haven't had a chance to see now. I'm looking at the clock, and I know that Pauline Kael is due elsewhere. A chance to talk about her very, very provocative uh, tribute to Bonnie and Clyde, it's provocative because it's had uh, two kinds of reviews. Bonnie and Clyde represented to you something quite exciting, isn't it? I think it represented a new kind of vitality. That is to say, it brought uh, a new feeling into, into American movies. And I think that's one of the great things about American movies, that they are responsive to changes in our life. And every once in a while, you get something that feels like you know, more like what's going on now. And that movie had it. I think it has many, many weaknesses, uh, but it, it brought something live back into pictures. And, and our pictures have been getting very slack, very dead. And that's why I responded so Even strongly. Even I was, of course, taken with it very much, I know that many critics, and perhaps they have a point of saying, that which we took to be exciting and almost revolution was became the very thing that was fashionable and vogue. Well, that's and awful. And I must say, when I see all the records and the clothes and all the rest of it, I'm depressed too. And when I hear some of the fancy statements now made by Arthur Penn about uh, what he thinks it means and the rest of it, I get depressed. But this is, of course, yeah. this is a chance you take when you praise anything that then other people will go too far. I did not say it was a great masterpiece. No. I think it's just a hell of a good movie. Over and beyond all this. Uh, Pauline Kael has written uh, quite a remarkable work on film. Uh, it's a work that has many forms, say long essays, analyses, uh, reviews, thoughts of performers, of directors, we just touched upon them. It's Kiss Kiss, Bang Bang, Atlantic Little Brown, the publishers, and quite a book. Pauline Kael, thank you very much. The words kiss, kiss, bang, bang, which I saw on an Italian movie poster, are perhaps the briefest statement imaginable of the basic appeal of movies. This appeal is what attracts us, and ultimately what makes us despair when we begin to understand how seldom movies are more than this. Thus Pauline Kael, with a little uh, epigraph to the book, Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, tells us in a sense what this book is about. Uh, movies, films, today in the 20th century in America particularly, and yet perhaps in the rest of the world. Pauline Kael, listeners probably know many as one of the most perceptive, accurate perhaps, but accurate where she should be, uh, critics, film critics of what perhaps is the most, certainly as far as the young, the most exciting and the most influential art form in the world today. She writes for New Yorker magazine after having been a writer who's aroused a great deal of controversy because of her, not only because of her, what she says, but I think her style too, where they're connected. And today with New Yorker, she's quite free. And Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the very title itself, in a way, isn't it? It's the, you saw this in Italian poster, you say. That's right. And it, it struck me because it's exactly why as kids we go to movies, because we want action. But when we get older, we've had the action movies, we want more. And we're starved for something more in movies. And that's the problem, because movies are still giving us the same old Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. But this leads to a question, a theme throughout this book. This book is a collection of essays, reviews, her thoughts, 
uh, art or business. And you open up with, the, with a, uh, to me, a very fascinating essay, The Creative Business. <laughs> now, the word show business, it's the noun that is italicized. That's right. It? Well, the, the, the creative business is very peculiar because men who make movies always talk about themselves as creative. And so far as I can see, being creative means for them simply that they have the ability to make money. Uh, a lot of these men are smart men who fought their way up through their fists. Some of them are second generation moguls, but they all seem to feel that they are creative, that they have ideas for movies, that they've really put something across, and they use strictly uh, a money valuation of creativity. The more money you make, the more creative you are in Hollywood, I'm afraid. And of course, if, if a critic praises a film that doesn't make very much money, they think you're wrong. Uh, they think you've made a mistake. They don't realize that you're doing it for a purpose, that perhaps you're trying to help this film reach people, that perhaps you're trying to help a young filmmaker. They simply think you're being a fool because you're not backing a winner. And what they really care about are the, are the big winners, and that's creativity for them. I suppose this is part of the whole American, I hate to use the word ethos, it's a very fancy word, I like that, <laughs> is that we cannot tolerate a loser. Even though that loser may do something that you and I, individual, may think is artistic, in the very true sense, we cannot tolerate. Well, I'm, I like losers. The same way I'm beginning to like seriousness. You know, and, and this is one thing that's interesting among college students now. When I went to work for The New Yorker, I got a great deal of mail from college students saying, uh, I hope you're not going to become urbane. Because urbane means to them that kind of s condescending uncle talk, that kind of wit crack, as they call it. Uh, and they were very pleased. Uh, I, got, I got some very negative mail from New Yorker readers, but a lot of the young kids were very pleased because they felt I hadn't sold out because I hadn't become urbane. Urbane means that you give in, you accept, and you make small jokes. Uh, whereas I think movies need something more than urbanity. Uh, urbanity doesn't get you anywhere in this world anymore. During your uh, sometimes book week talk, where you were there as one of the free speakers, you were speaking of the young, and this is in a way indirectly related to your book. And while well, the book is throughout involved with what you're talking about, the young who are making movies for rather little dough, this seems to be the hope, isn't it? You, sp you speak of not just Hollywood, but industry throughout. And the word industry, again, is a key word, isn't it? Well, the, the young are the only hope in movies for peculiar reasons. The, there are marvelously talented American directors, but they can't break through the business structure of movies. I think America has some of the, the finest directors in the world, but unless they have a huge hit, they can't buy their freedom. I think men like Irvin Kirshner and Sam Peckinpah uh, are as good as any of the Europeans, truly, if they ever got a chance to be free in making a movie. But so long as they're working through the business structure and have to compromise at every turn, what we get is, is simply a, a rough facsimile of what they could do. And so people think we don't have artists in America. Whereas the young, partly because movies are not really that expensive, there's foundation help now, and there's enough of a well-heeled uh, group in the young so they can scrounge money and equipment and make movies. And some of them around the colleges are beginning to do some fairly interesting stuff. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm thinking of a variety of the young, but also young who have made it. Uh, for example, you do an essay, and it's a very fascinating one, on how the, you are watching the making of a film, the adaptation of Mary McCarthy's The Group. And suddenly you are watching not a work of art, but you're watching a business enterprise in operation. Well, I was watching a movie being made under modern union conditions. I mean, this is how a professional director has to work. He has to work with a huge crew. Uh, he works with a script that he had no hand in the preparation of, for the most part. He takes a script and he executes it as fast as possible under modern union conditions. And there's no time for improvisation. There's no time for art. There's no time, really, for anything except just hatching your way through that script and shooting it, and then when you're finished trying to put something together. And what interested me was the fact that when they're finished shooting, what a heck of a time they have putting a movie together. Because uh, very often the pieces don't fit. 
and they they have to drop things that were vital to the story and the and the book is changed mostly not because of any basic reasons in terms of the difference between movies and literature but because at the end after you've shot your movie under modern union conditions you have to try to make it fit together uh, and so uh, all sorts of things were important in Mary McCarthy's whole approach are lost but the other thing is that that the men who make the movie which is a great deal more expensive after all than a book in any sense are are not really that concerned with what was in the book all they're concerned about is getting a movie that will sell on the screen and there was almost total indifference to what the values were in the book I think we should stick with this theme and this uh, to me a very revealing and very profound essay concerning ourselves and uh, uh, art quote-unquote and business Mary McCarthy wrote a book for better or for worse it was praised it was panned it's a book obviously dealing with her own memories of Vassar a certain time in the 30s. Sidney Lumet and uh, Sidney Buckman produced and directed it and a businessman, a producer named Charles K. Feldman helped make this book a bestseller. That's interesting. So we start at the beginning. This is a very review. Right. Thing. Well, Feldman bought the book uh, actually before publication date, but after all the major companies had already turned it down because they thought it wouldn't make a movie. I don't know if, if the listeners realize that before publication date, uh, books are submitted to movie companies because then the movie companies, of course, help in the promotion of a book because they add perhaps 100,000, 200,000, and to the promotion so that virtually they make a book a bestseller. Now, many people think that Mary McCarthy's book probably would have been a bestseller without any help from Feldman, but certainly the money he put into promoting it didn't hurt it, and it probably kept it on the bestseller list several extra weeks. Uh, Feldman's motivation, however, was not anything to do with literature, but simply to, to be able then to sell the package which he had acquired to a major studio. He was able to sell it to United Artists, although United Artists had already turned the novel down for production on their own. Feldman was an agent to start with, and agents generally become packagers. Some of them now become producers. Uh, public relations men now often produce, money, uh, produce pictures, and when you meet the producers of movies, you very often think you're not connected with a businessman at all. You, you feel more as if you're dealing with a gangster. Uh, I think the shocking thing, particularly for writers who tend to live in rather civilized circles, is talking to a studio head or to a big shot producer, because you have a very strange feeling that you're dealing with a mafia man. Uh, they think strictly in terms of, of very harsh realities. Uh, flesh and money are the primary considerations. Flesh money and power. Boyne yes. Kale is, is my guest, this very remarkable film critic, and the book is Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And as she's talking now, perhaps the audience realizes with me, I deliberately avoided reading reviews of this book, they were, although they were quite enthusiastic, Walter Kerr and one by Saul Maloff, but it was my own, the impact on me, that you were writing about more than movies. You know, since you were commenting on the very values of our society and how it works. Well, movies are the most popular uh, artistic medium, and I don't see how you can be a movie critic without being involved in the economics of our society and the values of our society, because really what makes a movie a success is how it touches people in certain ways. Very often, aesthetically, there's very little difference between a movie that's a flop and a movie that reaches 35 million people. But cert in certain ways, the audience is manipulated to react in, in the big money-making films, or in certain ways, they've been sold on going to see them. I think there are a number of big movies, like Camelot and Half a Sixpence, that people don't really react to, especially when they see them. But they've become such big artifacts economically. They represent represent such an investment, and that every time they turn on television or read a paper, they hear about this movie, so they feel they have to go see it. And movies like that, no matter what a critic says, the audience is going to go. You said something here, you spoke about these two films, and perhaps we're going to add Sound of Music, since it's played a, quite a role in the life of Pauline Kael. She wrapped this great investment and lost her job at McCall's, but uh, to our benefit, she's working right now for New Yorker, used the word artifact and industry. Isn't it? You said not art, but artifact. 
Right. Well, a movie like The Sound of Music is produced very, very shrewdly and cynically uh, by men who do know better, who are themselves cultivated liberal men with tremendous expertise and technological background and information. And they do it to a certain degree with, with embarrassment. I mean, they would rather be doing something else. Uh, but when it starts making as much money as that one did, uh, then they can take credit for it, too. Uh, they can feel they were giving the public what it wanted. And of course, then a critic who opposes this begins to seem un-American. And uh, if you attack the sound of music, you're almost attacking motherhood and American values and patriotism on the flag. And yet you point out there's a cynicism here by men who may know better. And I just, I, in many cases, I wonder what they do. But you quote here some producers, I'm an artist, says, I'll make two for the public and one for myself. Of course, this is the essence. They never make the one for themselves. That's, that's the thing. They always say, I'm making this picture this way in order to do something else. But then they deceive themselves about the next one. For example, Robert Wise, after making The Sound of Music, uh, uh, made The Sand Pebbles. And I think he probably thought that was one for himself. But if you look at The Sand Pebbles, you realize it's, it coexists in the same world as well, The Sound I, of you, Music. You and I talked about this in some other context. And uh, much as I admire your book, and it's, I say it's overwhelming in its impact, I wonder whether sometimes we don't o overestimate the sensitivity and intelligence, the very men who call themselves artists, quote unquote, liberals, you see. Perhaps that's the way they really are. Well, I think when you get to a certain, uh, you know, when your swimming pool gets that size, uh, liberalism changes its character. <clears throat> Fortunately, I've never known a critic with a swimming pool. Uh, and critics tend to, to view things somewhat differently. But it is interesting in Hollywood what, what does pass for liberalism, because I think they felt that a movie like The Sand Pebbles was a very daring movie to make, that it said something, although what it says is so nebulous that nobody's really sure what's going on in it. But I think in the case of, of Robert Wise and some of those men, I think they really are quite talented and intelligent yes. men. There are others who, who genuinely believe what, what they do, and those are, men are, of course, unreachable. I don't know what's worse, getting movies that are made cynically or movies that are made simply by people who are simply not very bright. But what is, what's really tough are for people to make the movies they want to make, for actors to get the roles they really need in order to show what they can do, for writers really to have any control over a script. Uh, you know, even now, when uh, uh, it was established after Bonnie and Clyde was released, for example, that those two young men who had wrote it had been trying to peddle that script for four years, uh, but they weren't even invited to the locations to see it being shot. They had no control over it whatsoever. And what are they doing now? They're working on a Western. This will be a, a freewheeling conversation, not necessarily chronological as far as the book is concerned, but thoughts. Uh, remind me to ask you about several things here, about the Academy Awards involving industry and art. And, well, Bonnie, and you mentioned, let's talk about the Academy Awards. We'll come back to Bonnie and Clyde. This is right. also a very celebrated piece by Pauline Kael, New Yorker, that may involve a back and forth discussion of the impact of this film. Uh, Academy Awards, uh, these are men these are women, these are makers of films who look at it, and we watch it, and I find it amusing. They're to liberalism, in the heat of the night, and tribute was <laughs> paid. Now you see, yeah. this is also, yeah. the word show biz seems to be the overruling, it's somehow it's something you cannot quite take seriously. I know. Well, you know what's funny about In the Heat of the Night? It really is an enjoyable, amusing movie. But what is it? It's a detective story with Sidney Poitier as a black Sherlock Holmes and Rod Steiger as a redneck shuffling uh, uh, Watson. And so it's basically a comedy of reversals. And it's a very amusing detective story, even though the plot gets lost, so by the end you're not sure uh, who done it. So it's rather a badly told detective story but the fringe the fringe aspects of it everything that was played up in it that gave it a kind of civil rights phony impact is is I think what got it the Academy Award I think this of course leads us to uh, Stanley Kramer and his film the defiant ones as you point out and as James Baldwin has pointed out in many how the nice white <laughs> sits and watches when Sidney Potter hops over off the train to help his friend Tony Curtis to escape the chain gang and 
in the white theaters, everybody applauded. But in the heart of this is, you fool, get back on that train. <laughs> well, the, the differences in how audiences react to these movies are interesting. Negroes uh, sitting around me in the theater at In the Heat of the Night really loved it, and they enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it too. But I don't think they reacted that, that happily to the scene where Poitier slaps the white man, because, of course, there's no reason for it, and it's completely extraneous to the plot. But a lot of white people felt it really showed an advance in movies to have a Negro slapping a white man, even if it didn't belong in that movie. I was thinking of the Academy Award when I raised in the heat of the, I think the, the ceremony itself. There was one moment, I wanted to watch it, there was one moment when George Cukor, the director, came up and he wasn't sure whether the guy who presented the award to him, he was accepting it for Catherine Hepburn, who was Sidney Poitier's and Soto Voce, millions heard him say, did you tell them who I am? Oh. Now, I think, did you tell them who I am is what it's all about. Yeah, well, that's a very touching statement for Kukor, who's one of the old, pretty decent directors over the years. But what's, what was sad about that whole show, I think that two and a half hours really revealed the emptiness and deadness of Hollywood. It was one of the most poorly staged, unpleasant shows. Even the audience there didn't applaud for the old stars when they came on. All those war horse old ladies make, you know, with their preserved faces. They were wearing masks of their old faces put on top of their poor old heads. Uh, they looked horrible. They didn't get very much of a response. There was a feeling of death about the whole show. And then, of course, they had missed every chance they really had to, do, to show that they were alive. I mean, Haskell Wexler's photography was great on In the Heat of the Night, so he didn't even get a nomination. Uh, they didn't give the screenplay award to Benton and Newman. They gave it to William Rose for a tired old hack con job on Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Uh, they, they missed every real chance to show they were alive, and I think it was, it was revealed to the audience, By the way, too. Pauline Kael really, in a sense, is talking about life, talking about joy. Uh, what a good film can be, even even a tragic film, exhilarating in a strange way as Lear is. We're talking about something else now. She's talking about the sadness. We'll come back to the group in a moment, your analysis of a young director, a good man, Lummet, who has power, and old friends of his who seek jobs. I couldn't help but think of the brilliant British actress, distinguished Edith Evans, playing Stooge to Bob Hope. Wasn't that joke. horrible? Well, that's one of the awful things about the Academy Award show. They feel everybody has to crack those terrible jokes. And I don't know who they're for anymore because it's a miscalculation of the audience because we sit there and we're embarrassed uh, for these people having to do that. Edith Evans should not, should not have to do that. But if you play this whole celebrity circus, uh, you get caught in that. One of the things that, that I did write about in the piece on the group was the old actors trying to get jobs. And it was, a, it was I, I was in on the movie, you see, during the casting as well as during the production. And I watched many famous players whose names I, of course, will not say, trying to get bit part jobs. I mean, people who had once been stars. And they were willing to do anything to get a role. This is one of the things people don't understand. There are so few plays and movies being no, made. I think the style of Pauline Kale is interesting in moving. Why don't you read that particular... Oh, oh, fine, Studs. Uh, this is in the casting room. Powerlessness made them uncertain of how to deal with the power of the director and the producer. Desperation made them transparent. The women in turbans or big tricky hats all seemed to apologize for their hair. One after another explained how their agents had just notified them of the interview. Asked their height, most of the men gave the all-purpose 5'11", wanting to be considered neither too short nor too tall for whatever the role might be. In fear of being considered wrong and not knowing what they were being considered for, they tried to pass themselves off as every man. They had been preceded, of course, by photographs, large, glossy, glamorous photographs sent in by agents. And as Lummet said, what's heartbreaking is the pictures versus the people. We saw them as they had looked or could look or had been doctored to look, and then we saw them. It was like people on television commercials versus people in subways. 
and I was horrified because they were people I knew. I had seen them in my childhood in the theater in San Francisco. I had seen them touring with Catherine Cornell or acting in New York hits. I had seen them long ago in the movies as juvenile leads or in character roles. Almost all of them were familiar names in the theater, people I thought of as established, secure, honored. And here they were trying to get bit parts, eager for a few days' work, for a two-line role, and not knowing whether to conceal their desperation or whether to expose it. You could see them trying to calculate how much front they should put on or whether a naked appeal would be preferable. And they spoke in voices I knew so well, the voices that seemed to belong to their past more than to their present. And as Pauline Kael reads this, of course, it's terribly moving because it's terribly true. We never say the sweet truth, say the awful truth. It's funny, you're really talking about humiliation, aren't you? And nobody, certainly not Lummet is to blame, he understood this. It, no, Lummet was very sensitive to this because he was a child actor and his father was an actor. Uh, a great many people in show business are, are not that uh, uh, heartfelt about it. And he, was set, he tried to protect them from the humiliation. Uh, on other occasions, I've seen people very nakedly humiliated. What, what was awful, however, was that the young actresses on the set with the older people who did get the roles, the young actresses did not recognize that these were once famous people and treated them as if they were grips or someone on the set. At this point, uh, you, um, audience recalls uh, the group, either the, the novel or the film, Eight Girls to be Discovered. We talk about Feldman's role, and it's fascinating, too. So he could be the agent for the girls, too, properties. But the, there's no continuity then. Uh, suddenly, into the world come eight young actresses who are celebrities, and forgotten, gradually forgotten, are people of the long past. That's right. But, you know, the girls were protected in this case because the writer and, I mean, the director and producer, the producer was also the writer, Sidney Buckman, uh, protected them somewhat against the whole Hollywood circus. Uh, they did not have to become whores like Hollywood starlets. Uh, they they di were not forced to sign long-term contracts, although a few of them did. But uh, Feldman's uh, admitted role in, in signing up this book was to get a young starlets under contract who then he would have for loan out deals later and there are many men in Hollywood and in motion picture business who make their principal revenue uh, on the pieces they own of actors they give their first chance to. A number of directors will not give an actor a, a key role unless that actor will give him a percentage of his earnings for five or ten years or even into perpetuity. So we come back to the aspect of industry again. Uh, in this remarkable essay and is uh, the making. You, you were sitting in throughout uh, the casting, the making, the filming. That's right. I sat in uh, a major magazine commissioned me to do the article. They did not print it uh, when I completed the article. Uh, so it, the first time it's being published is in this book. Uh, there's a good reason for this. Most people want uh, a sweetness and light view of the making of movies. They want to see it all as those beautiful, creative people cooperating with each other and everybody loving everybody. And they don't really want anything more analytic. So that most uh, production stories, so-called, are actually written by people who make a deal with the advertising department of the movie to place this article in a major magazine. Whereas I try to do it fairly seriously on the assumption that people really are interested in what happens. I read this, I guess, with a, a number of thoughts in mind. As I was reading it, thoughts flashed to me. This one chapter in, in Pauline Kael's book, the book is Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, and the publishers are Atlantic Little Brown, interested in the idea of movies in any way, the film, its impact on you. And by the way, we haven't talked about the her reviews of films, the 280, and memories come to me as I read those. Uh, a number of essays are here, and in this one on the group, uh, another aspect occurs to me how, if I could return to the actors trying to impress the director, the desperation, desperation is hidden. Their acting roles at that moment, I couldn't help but think of a film with, a Renoir film whom you like, with Louis Jouvet. An old actor's home. Remember it was End oh, of the Day? Oh, oh yes, yes, End of a Day. It had Michel Simon and uh, Victor Francin. It, uh, however, it was Duvivier, not Renoir, if you'll forgive me. Right, Julien Duvivier, who, who just died recently. And I must say the obituaries didn't give him anything like the credit he deserved for some of the important uh, pictures he made, because in many ways he was more important in making French films popular in this country even than Renoir. 
Uh, but uh, that whole matter of actor's egotism. Yeah. You remember that film, the one? Oh, I certainly do. Playing the Don and in a sense, this is what you're saying in real life, this was happening. They do it. Uh, and they're forced to do it because they have to pretend to themselves to some degree that they're still important. Because there are enough people who know them and recognize them. There are buffs all over the world to whom these men are still famous. And these men are, are trying to get unemployment checks every week. The actor's life in America is perhaps the worst. You know, in Hollywood, there are only nine pictures being shot at the moment. You know how many actors are out there. In New York, there are so few older actors being used in plays because, of course, that whole the theatrical diction, the, the English, the British mm -hmm. stage presence, everything they stand for has become unpopular now anyway. Uh, I mean, for example, my own daughter says, you know what, I can't stand the sound of theater. And what she means is all that all that beautiful diction that they worked a lifetime to perfect. Kids now don't like it. They don't want it. And these people are, are trying to sell themselves, and they are themselves an outmoded commodity. A commodity, the word, uh, the actor, the performer, is a property. Someone says, Marlon Brando is a valuable property. But Brando, being Brando, doesn't want to be a property. Well, it's one of the ingratiating yeah. things about Brando, who I still think is our greatest actor. So, by the way, it's a very, uh, a very endearing uh, portrait of Brando, her own, and yet with the remarkable understanding by Pauline Kael. Speaking of careers. Well, I think it's become fashionable to attack actors, and not just Brando, but all of them. When they get to a certain size, then people start blasting them for doing what they're doing. And sometimes they rate it, but in other cases, they get blasted just because of their attempt to keep their independence. I mean, because they're fighting uh, to keep a little bit of freedom. And of course, the gossip columnists and all go along with this. They still do. Even now, we don't have Hedda and Luella anymore. But every newspaper has its little items and the bitchiness uh, that's used. And this, of course, works against critics, too. Well, obviously, uh, someone as independent as he, as almost as animal as he uh, was, had, had to antagonize it by his very being, since he did not he was not ingratiating, isn't that it? I isn't think everybody point? good has to antagonize people, in, in movies particularly. Uh, I mean, people with talent can't be nice guys and do anything in this world. They really have to be so strong to preserve any kind of independence or integrity. Because if you're a nice guy, you, become a, you can become a Jimmy Stewart or a Robert Taylor. I don't know whether they're nice guys or not. That's indifferent, a matter of indifference. But I mean, if you go along with the system and play anything they hand you, and make a lot of money and play golf or go swimming. Young men most likely to succeed. That's right. But a man who really wants to do something worth doing, uh, he has to fight for it. So you have another portrait of someone most likely not to succeed because he was larger than life, and of course, Orson Welles. You know. Well, I think Orson Welles should be our greatest director at this moment. And I, think, I don't think it's his fault. I think Orson Welles could have been for the sound film what D.W. Griffith was for the silent film, because Welles had the feeling for American speech. And when he was forced to go work abroad, he lost his greatest asset, which was the radio sound, the overlapping dialogue, the feeling for American coarseness and vitality and vigor. I mean, he really had it. Uh, there's a kind of playfulness and excitement about Wells' work that's, that's pure American. And yet he had to go abroad in order to work to make movies. And his, his movies abroad are generally post-synchronized or dubbed, so all the sound is disintegrated anyway. And he's never been able to, to really make the films he should have been made. I think it's our greatest single loss, Wells. Technically terrible, but uh, spiritually fantastic. <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's great, and it comes through. I mean, when you see this man on the screen, even when he's playing some rotten little part, he's big. He's great. Coming back to Wells and the films he had to make, whether it be Falstaff, but the sound is bad. But coming back, and this is direct contrast to the group come back again. The group is someone of infinitely lesser talent. We're not talking about morality, infinitely lesser talent, but who was able to meet that budget and make it, and Wells obviously could never meet it. Again. That means you're a professional. If you can stay within your budget, and Lummet gets jobs because he even completes his movies ahead of budget, because he, he learned his trade in live television, and he shoots very fast. He shoots his movies like live television plays. He's very careless. He doesn't care if the color is variable from one take to the next, if the sound is all, is, you know, is, is absolutely impossible. They post-synchronize. Anything that goes wrong, they fix it 
it up later. The important thing is to finish the picture on schedule. Because if he didn't, he probably wouldn't get the next job. It's a good package. That's right. It's a good package. And so you have someone who can never... And now, so the art of improvisation, you talk about the improvisatory aspect. That's the art. Films, <laughs> is the art. So therefore, to improvise is to take all, up all kinds of valuable time and budget. Well, there are men who can shoot a movie exactly as and prepared. Hitchcock, 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 and I think possibly Frankenheimer and a few others who have that kind of technique. But the men who really want to do something more exploratory, who want to find their way, who want to use the accidents, want to use the opportunity, really want to, to make a work of art, just can't do it under under American Hollywood conditions. So we, go, we go back and forth, we come back to Wells again. Therefore, Wells, being unpredictable, being the improvisator he is, and being the man he is, was not a trusty product. Was not That's right. Well, man. but he had another disadvantage. It, Wells has made some movies on schedule and stuck to the script. The Stranger was one, because, of course, he's a brilliant craftsman. But Wells never had a really big hit. And if you don't have a really Citizen big hit... Citizen Kane wasn't No, a big Citizen hit. Kane was not a big hit. He's hit, you mean commercial. Uh, com if, a, if you don't have a movie that really makes money, you see, if you, ma if you have a money-making a money -making movie, then they decide you're a genius or an artist and they trust you. And you can have a series of flops, uh, but they still think of that one picture that made money. But if you never have a big money maker, <coughs> look at a man like Otto Preminger. He makes terrible pictures. Most of them lose money. But he's had a few winners, and he brings the others in on schedule, and he, he keeps getting backing to make these terrible pictures. These guys make the tracks run on time. That's right. So we come back to, to so many things. You, you speak of, you mentioned television several times. I uh, knew the impact of television on movies, and there is a difference. Many of the young directors have had their training in television, in contrast, say, to uh, John Ford. And something happens, you point out here in... Uh, in westerns, something happens. What to our eye? Well, to well, uh, television uh, develops a different kind of eye, a whole different approach. Because of course, television is basically the two shot. Uh, you know, the A B camera shooting. The 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 basic camera work on television is geared to one person talking and another person listening, and then the camera position changes, and you and you get a reversal of roles. Uh, television works best when there are generally two people on the screen. You don't get very much complexity. Whereas movies traditionally, you not only had action in the foreground, you had a great of action in the background, and you had correlations and things going on, movement in between. Well, the television directors, when they graduate into movies, use the basic television technique, which is very, very fast. They simply shoot things right in the middle of the screen. And of course, uh, they're also cognizant of the fact that when it's shown on television in a few years, the sides are going to be cut off anyway, and what goes on in the distance is going to be eliminated or fuzzy. So the basic action right in the middle, uh, what, would, what would be shot almost on the proscenium arch, is all that, all that matters finally for the television image, and they make movies this way. Uh, there was a Western shot this way just recently, Will Penny, uh, which was actually directed by its author, but all the action was in the middle of the screen, and it seemed to take place about five feet uh, from the camera and just move to the camera and then back and forth. Well, it's going to look great on television, Whereas the work of a real movie artist often is almost totally lost on television. If you see Magnificent Ambersons or Citizen Kane or a great Jean Renoir Ford film on television, almost everything visual is lost anyway. So a question of space involved here. That's right. And, and speed. speed. The speed. Uh, because it's so much cheaper to shoot your action right in front of the camera and not worry about distances and space and second and third dimensions. Uh, just figure all that's, they, they think all that's, uh, you know, art. Uh, what they're concerned about is just telling the story as fast as possible and giving you the maximum number of sensations and jolts. Visually, of course, these movies are dead to look at in a theater. I mean, it's almost unendurable watching them sometime because the act, it's just like sitting in your front room watching things on television. There's not anything more going on than in a television play. As you say this, uh, you were talking about westerns. And again, we think of the American film, the western. I remember so many people from European countries came. They wanted to see a western immediately. And yet you said that the movie is the only art form in which the past can be forgotten. Stagecoach, originally 
directed by John Ford, has had films. It's that been follow. withdrawn from circulation by uh, the behest of a producer named Martin Rackin, who uh, made the later version of Stagecoach starring Bing Crosby. And Rackin says that uh, there's no reason why people should want to see a 32-year-old movie. Uh, Rackin also told me the other day, I, I did a radio show with him and discussed this issue of the withdrawal of, of one of our great, uh, great parts of the American cultural heritage from circulation. Uh, it's, li it's like burning a book when you withdraw a great movie from circulation. He's saying uh, something new. That's right. The new is better. Uh, but uh, he's a remarkable man anyway. He said to me, we met in the television studio, and I was wearing a corduroy coat. And he said, now that I see you, I don't have to worry. He said, if you were wearing mink, I'd be worried. Well, that, that's uh, <laughs> and he did a one-man editorial on himself right there. Well, he's remarkable. an extraordinary yeah. man. Yes. He, he, he told me that he was creative. Well, you see, there we come. We come to the theme earlier that uh, Pauline Kael talked about, the creative man, the creative <laughs> businessman. All Hollywood producers call themselves creative. Back to stage.